Island Crimes and Mysteries with Newells. Hey guys and welcome to another episode of Ireland Crimes and Mysteries. I want to thank you for joining me today and if you're a returning listener I want to say a big thank you for your continued support. If this is your first time listening to my podcast, welcome. It's great to have you on board. So without further ado, let's get started on today's story. So before we start um, today's episode, I just want to give you a trigger warning. I will be discussing infant homicide and as well as abortion will also be touched upon. And also I will be talking about mother and baby institutions and the treatment of women by the state and the church back in the 1980s. So I just want to make you aware of that before we start the episode that these subjects are going to be discussed. Today's case takes us to Cahars Iveen in the very picturesque county of Kerry. A small town with a population of no more than 1,300 people situated on the Skellig coast along the Wild Atlantic Way and the Ring of Kerry in the southwest of Ireland. Described on its official webpage as the town that climbs the mountain and looks upon the sea. It boasts lots of beautiful unspoiled landscape and stunning beaches where you can immerse yourself in your surroundings. With breathtaking walks such as the Beantree Loop, a nine kilometre trek that will take you to the top of Beantree Mountain that has stunning views over Cahersivine and Valencia. There is plenty to do and see around Cahersivine, especially if you are of the outdoors enthusiast type. If fishing is your thing, there is an abundance of fresh water and sea fishing. The Atlantic Ocean will become your playground. You could also take a trek by horse along the beach and see the sunset or canter through the lush green countryside or forest. Cahersivine has many equestrian centres that can facilitate one, two or even three hour rides no matter whether you are a complete beginner or a horse riding enthusiast. If food is your passion, you won't be disappointed either. Given its location, there are some lovely restaurants with mouth-watering freshly caught fish on the menu. But don't worry, there are restaurants to suit all manner of taste. Cahar Sivine also has fabulous pubs with many live music sessions taking place, bringing you a taste of trad while you enjoy your pint. Then each year over the August Bank Holiday weekend, the Carhersheim Bean Festival of Music and Arts takes place, bringing various acts to the stage as well as lots of street entertainment. A great weekend for both adults and children alike. All in all, between the enchantment of this small town and its very friendly locals and the stunning countryside surrounding it, you won't be disappointed if you visit Carhersheim as you journey along the famous and gorgeous Ring of Kerry. Our story today takes us to this small community and to the date of the 14th of April 1984. This was a time before the tourism trail had found Cahar Sivine. Its community was insular and with such a small population, everyone knew everyone and what was going on in each other's lives. A typical small Irish town for its time. The 14th of April 1984 was a Saturday and a day like every other day until later that evening around 8.30pm. A man who was out for a run on White Strand Beach, approximately three kilometres from Cahar Sivine, made a gruesome discovery. As he reached the far side of the beach, he saw something on the rocks and went to inspect what it was he could see off in the distance. As he got closer, he still couldn't figure out what he was looking at. It was getting dusky, but thought it looked like a baby. Not believing his own eyes, he went for help and brought back his brother-in-law to see if he could make out what they were looking at. To their absolute horror, his brother-in-law confirmed it was indeed a newborn baby that appeared to have washed up on the rocks of White Strand Beach. Nearby lay a plastic fertiliser bag that was later assumed to be what the little baby had originally been placed in. I was running on the strand, and the, the far end of the strand, and something caught my eye in the right, and I just looked, and I saw I saw the doll first, and so I checked it out, and well, it was frightening, you know, actually, scary. Yeah. Gardy were immediately called to the scene, as was the local undertaker. 
who removed the baby from the rocks and christened the little boy there and then, calling him Baby John. On the Sunday morning, the people of Cahar Sivine, as well as the whole nation, were waking up to the gruesome news that the body of a newborn baby had been found on the beach. The baby was removed to the hospital in Killarney and the state pathologist, Dr John Harbison, was notified to come and carry out the post-mortem on baby John. On examination of the baby, it was revealed that baby John had been stabbed 28 times three of which were to the chest and heart, which was likely the fatal wound. His neck had also been broken. Dr. Harbison estimated that baby John was approximately five days old when he died this violent death and had been dead for approximately three days when he was found. Now the search was on to find baby John's mother and find out what exactly happened to him. Who was this baby? Where did he come from? And how did he end up on a beach horrifically murdered? The whole community was in shock. People began to speculate. Had the baby been thrown from a passing ship and washed up on these shores? The thought that a local person was responsible was not something that people were ready to contemplate. But the whispers were there and the main question on everybody's lips was, who killed baby John? Meanwhile, the investigation into the baby's murder was in full swing. If they could find the mother, the hope was it would lead to the person who had committed this heinous crime. The Gardaí from the get-go were convinced the suspect had to be a local person and from in or around the Cahar Sivine area. The newspapers were full of stories of the tragedy and pleas for the mother to come forward and make herself known. The Gardaí focused in on all the young women in the area of childbearing years and as time went on, these young women and their families felt the intrusion into their private lives was too much. People were ringing the Gardaí telling them that they thought that their teenage neighbour was pregnant when it was completely untrue. A few girls who had travelled to England for an abortion and had not told their parents were outed when the Gardaí came knocking on their door. Abortion was banned in Ireland under the Eighth Amendment, which acknowledged the right to life of the unborn and effectively made the life of the unborn baby equal to that of the mother. So for these girls to be outed for travelling to England would have caused them great distress and made them pariahs in the community. The way the investigation was being handled and progressing was beginning to get people's backs up. Of course, this was a time in Ireland when to become pregnant out of wedlock was perceived as a mortal sin and any young woman who did become pregnant was basically ostracised from their community. The Catholic Church still reigned supreme in Ireland and the majority of the people followed their doctrine to the letter, never questioning it in any way. Women who would become pregnant in this patriarchal church were treated abominably and became known as fallen women. Often for decades being hidden away in institutions like the Magdalene Laundries where they, when they became pregnant. The family's dirty little secret. The babies would then be snatched from the mother after birth and in a lot, if not all, the majority of the cases sold by the clergy to a wealthy family who were desperately wanting a family of their own either in Ireland or abroad, often America. This time period in Irish history is still a massive stain on our country. How these women who were already traumatised were treated beggars belief in modern day society. So for the local young women of Cahar Sivine to be treated with such disdain during this investigation was not unusual, but in hindsight was an appalling way of conducting this investigation. But this was only the start of the mistreatment of suspects in this case. Far more was ahead as it would progress. Only a few months previous to the discovery of baby John, on the 31st of January 1984, the case of Anne Lovett had made the headlines. Anne was 15 years old at the time when she died giving birth at a grotto in Granard, County Longford, to her stillborn baby. Probably in fear and desperation and feeling like she had no one to turn to, she went to the grotto and gave birth alone. 
As I said, to be pregnant out of wedlock in this time period in Ireland was a very lonely place to be indeed. And many women and young girls literally had nowhere to turn when they found themselves in this position. There was no help, no love, no acceptance. And as a result, some extremely desperate women went to extreme measures to hide their pregnancies for fear of consequences. As the investigation continued and woman after woman was being crossed off the suspect list, it was becoming more obvious that the Gardaí needed to cast their net a little wider. By sheer coincidence, Garda Superintendent John Courtney, who worked with the Garda Technical Bureau, was holidaying in Kerry while the investigation was ongoing, and he would get talking to local Gardaí about the case. Before long, he had assembled a team and they were Kerry bound to do their own investigation into the murdered baby under the guise of assisting the local Gardaí. These specialised detectives were used to a certain way of conducting their investigation, which wasn't necessarily the way this particularly sensitive investigation needed to be conducted. They were used to dealing with hardened criminals, not potentially a traumatised young girl who had recently given birth under very traumatic circumstances. Soon this investigative team turned their focus away from Cahar Savine to Tralee. A list was compiled of three women in the area who were yet to be investigated. Two of the women were quickly eliminated as their babies were alive and with their mothers. The third and final woman on the list was a lady called Joanne Hayes. Joanne was 25 years old at the time, a single girl who grew up on a farm in Abbey Dorney, approximately 80 kilometres from Cahar Sivine. She worked in a sports centre in Traldi. In 1981, she met a man named Jeremiah Locke, a married man with one child, who also worked at the sports centre, and they started seeing each other. Before long, Joanne was pregnant and had a little girl with Jeremiah. She had hoped when she found out that she was pregnant that Jeremiah would leave his wife to be with Joanne. But Jeremiah was not going to leave his marriage. Joanne was different from other pregnant girls at the time in that her family supported her and embraced the little girl into the family fold with them both living at home on the family farm. Then in July of 1983, and after some time apart, the relationship with Jeremiah was rekindled and before long Joanne found herself pregnant again. During this time, Joanne found out that his wife was also pregnant with the couple's second child. This deeply upset Joanne, leading to a confrontation with his wife. This pregnancy for Joanne was a highly stressful one. Again, she had hoped that Jeremiah would leave his wife to be with her, but again she would be disappointed. Now she was pregnant out of wedlock for the second time with her married man's baby. Joanne had arrived at Tralee Hospital with complications in line with recently having suffered a miscarriage. The hospital staff were sceptical as on examination it became obvious to them that Joanne had indeed given birth. For Gardy, this was hardly a coincidence so soon after the discovery of baby John. They were sure they were on the right track and Joanne must be the mother. She fitted their profile of who the mother of baby John may be, a woman of low morals. There was also the fact that the baby's body was found beside a fertiliser bag and Joanne came from a farming background. The investigation turned its focus to Abby Dorney, with Joanne now their prime suspect. Abby Dorney is a small village in Kerry and the Hayes family were an integral part in the village community. One day prior to the discovery of baby John, on the 13th of April, Joanne had given birth somewhere on the Hayes' farm to a baby who unfortunately would not survive. After giving birth, Joanne was bleeding heavily and went to the hospital in Tralee and she told the medical staff she had suffered a miscarriage. The staff didn't buy Joanne's explanation and believed she had given birth to a full-term baby. But Joanne is adamant she had a miscarriage. She was treated for her bleeding at the hospital and then discharged. So of course for investigators, the coincidence was too much. 
there is a murdered baby in Cahir Saivin with no mother. And in Tralee, there is a mother who, according to trained medical staff, definitely gave birth, but has no baby. For investigators, Joanne had to be baby John's mother. Joanne was arrested on the 1st of May from her work. Members of her family, including her brothers Ned and Michael, her sister Kathleen and her aunt Bernie, were also arrested. They were brought to Tralee Garda Station to be interviewed. The questioning of the family went on in separate rooms throughout the night. They were grilled. Two detectives interviewed Joanne at Lent. Joanne told detectives she had given birth standing up in a field and placed the baby on top of some hay. She said she went back inside distraught and did not go out to the baby until the following day where she found the baby deceased. She told detectives that she then put the baby in the septic tank. When the detectives told Joanne they were going to drain the septic tank, Joanne said she had lied. The baby was not in the tank. She said she had actually placed the baby in a paper bag and put it in a pond on the farm. She drew a diagram of where the baby was. Members of the technical bureau went out to search the area while Joanne remained in custody. The Gardaí, of course, were sceptical, believing Joanne was baby John's mother. They assumed this story that Joanne was telling was concocted to divert away from the truth. And to add to the Gardaí's belief that they had their woman, the technical bureau returned saying they had not found any baby in the water. Joanne was distraught at this stage. It is believed that the Gardaí didn't put much effort into searching the farm for the baby as they had already come to their own conclusions. Then four hours into the interrogations, Joanne's siblings all made identical statements confessing to their involvement into the murder of baby John at White Strand. Their signed statements all said that Joanne had stabbed the baby three times in the chest and hit the baby with a toilet brush around the head and neck numerous times before the baby died. Their statements went on to say that her brother Ned and her sister Kathleen then wrapped the baby in newspaper and a clear plastic bag and then a brown bag before finally putting it into the fertiliser bag and then another grey bag. The statement said they then drove to Tralee and on into Dingle. They drove out of Dingle and stopped the car approximately six miles past the village at Slayhead. Then allegedly Ned got the baby out of the boot and threw it into the sea where it was then washed up at White Strand Beach. These statements all fitted like a glove, nice and neat. Joanne's aunt Bridie, who lived with them and was a trained nurse, even allegedly stated that she had delivered the baby. Joanne was then shown all these supposed statements from her family members, which held an entirely different story to the one Joanne had been telling investigators. They even presented her with a bat brush and a kitchen knife that her family had allegedly told them were the murder weapons. After being presented with all the statements and the alleged murder weapons, Joanne, after being interrogated for over eight hours, relented and concurred with the statements presented. Saying in her statement that she had to kill the baby because of the shame it would bring to her family and because of the fact Jeremiah would not run away with her. She stated that the scene was a bloody mess with the bed and floor covered in the baby's blood. She said she knew when the baby was found in Carcivin that it was her baby. She even went on to say that she had named him Shane. She said she was sorry and asked for God's forgiveness. She then stated she had listened to her statement read back to her and she did not wish to change any of it, that it was all correct. That night, Joanne was charged with murder. The remainder of her family were charged with concealment of birth. But this was only the beginning of the saga. Pat Mann, who was Joanne's solicitor, would have his work cut out for him. But he was determined to prove Joanne and her family's innocence. He had met with a very distraught Joanne at Tralee Court the day she was due to be officially charged. Joanne explained to him through her tears that she, they were accusing her of killing her baby and showed him the charge sheet that said she was charged with murder. To his shock, she told him that the rest of the family had charges against them as well. The whole family were distraught at the situation they had found themselves in as Pat busied himself trying to prepare for their court appearance. They went before the judge that day 
And Joanne's family were granted bail, but Joanne was not, as her charge of murder meant she would be remanded in custody and she was sent to Limerick's women's prison. None of the locals of Abbey Dorney believed that anyone in the family would be capable of any of the charges against them. Prior to leaving the courthouse, Joanne asked to speak to her sister Kathleen and she told Kathleen exactly where she had buried the baby on the farm. Later that day, the family searched the area she had told them the baby was in. After extensively searching the area and having no results initially, the baby was found. They immediately rang their solicitor, Pat Mann, who told them not to touch a thing, and he immediately rang the local guardy. When the guardy arrived, they walked to the spot where the family were, and there in front of them, they could see what looked like the remains of a baby. Joanne's story had been true all along. This new discovery had turned the case on its head. The guardy had never believed Joanne when she said she had given birth to a stillborn baby boy and buried it on the family farm. But now there was no denying that Joanne had been telling the truth. Where did the guardy go from here? They now had two dead baby boys, a signed confession from Joanne saying she had killed the baby in Cahir Sivine as well as confessions from her family saying they had helped dispose of the baby's body. The whole situation and case was in complete disarray. The question on everybody's lips now was, why had the family made these confessions? As I said, the locals did not believe that this quiet, unassuming family that had never been in trouble with the law in any way had suddenly turned to murder. Had they been coerced into signing these statements? After all, the statements from Joanne's family members were all extremely similar in how they were worded. Had they been threatened in any way? Had the detectives been heavy-handed with the family on questioning? Something was not right. The baby found on the farm, it was determined at autopsy, had indeed been stillborn and had not been harmed in any way, unlike the baby found at White Strand Beach. Then there was the inevitable questions and one in particular. Was Joanne the mother of both babies? This is the line that the guardie took. They were going to prove that Joanne was the mother of both babies and were not willing to divert in any way, shape or form or even entertain the notion that somebody else was actually responsible for baby John's murder. Of course Joanne denied that she had given birth to twins, stating she had nothing whatsoever to do with the white strand baby. Guardie, on the other hand, insisted they were going ahead with the charge of murder against Joanne and the charges brought against her family. Evidence presented by the Technical Bureau was then sent to the National Forensic Lab, where they would do tests to check the twins' theory. Now, forensic technology in the early 1980s was primitive, to say the least. Having submitted part of Baby John's lung and acquiring a blood sample from Jeremiah Locke, and after grouping the samples, it was determined that Baby John was blood group A, Joanne was known already to be blood group O and Jeremiah was also blood group O, which essentially meant he could not be the father of baby John. Then the baby found on Joanne's farm was also tested against the blood sample from Jeremiah. This baby was blood group O, which meant Jeremiah could not be excluded as being the father of this baby. The items used according to the statements by Joanne and her family to murder baby John were also examined and nothing of significance was found on any of them. With all the new evidence favouring Joanne and her family, Joanne was granted bail on the 11th of May, and the whole family withdrew their confessions. But the investigating officers, determined not to be proved wrong, started coming up with the most ridiculous theories. One being that Joanne was pregnant with twins that had two different fathers. The whole case was becoming a farce. It appeared the Gardaí were going to go to any lengths to prove that Joanne had given birth to twins, one stillborn and one that she had brutally murdered and, with the help of her family, disposed of in the sea before it was washed up on White Strand Beach. Joanne had suffered immeasurably at the hands of these detectives from day one. Her whole life had been laid out to the public to devour in a time in Ireland when sex out of wedlock was considered a mortal sin and women were vilified if they it became known that they were partaking in such activities or became pregnant. The pressure on Joanne must have been immense 
Not only was she probably grieving the loss of her baby, but she was also charged with a murder she had not committed and had essentially proved she hadn't committed, but had been still languishing for a long period of time in Limerick Prison before her release on bail. Meanwhile, the prosecution were trying to put together some sort of case to bring Joanne to trial. At the same time, the Director of Public Prosecution's office were doing their own research from all the evidence laid out before them and were quickly coming to the realisation that this whole case was a travesty of justice. The DPP could see that the forensic evidence did not match up with the story given by the Gardaí or the signed statements that had been given probably under duress by the family. Then, on the 10th of October, an update on the charges against Joanne and her family. The charge against Joanne for murdering baby John was struck out by the judge at Tralee District Court. The charges against the four members of her family, her two brothers, Ned and Michael, her sister Kathleen and her aunt Bridie, were also struck out. The focus now turned to how these statements had been gathered from the family in the first place. Obviously untrue, but extremely detailed, each individual statement, practically the same, all signed by the family and of course Joanne. How could this happen? It had also been noted from evidence that when the baby was found on the beach, it was dry, which contradicted the statement that the baby had been thrown from the cliff at Slayhead and had made its way over to White Strand Beach. So how had these statements actually been taken, and under what means? This was the question on everybody's lips. Then Joanne and her family gave a few interviews on television, where they gave their side of the story, and what allegedly happened when they were being interviewed by the detectives. According to her brother, when interviewed, he said, we went in at 12 and it was 1.10 on the following morning when we got home. At one stage we were told we would not be left home unless we signed the statements. Joanne told the programme that two detectives from Dublin came in and were roaring and shouting at her and one slapped her across the face twice. Joanne went on to say she was crying all the time. She said she was really frightened. The detectives in question have always denied these allegations, saying they treated Joanne and her family like they were their own family members. A stark contrast to the Hayes family's perception of how the interviews went down. Joanne had said it was all like a bad dream that she hoped she would eventually wake up from. She said she had allegedly been threatened that if she did not sign the statement that her young daughter would be taken from her and her own mother charged with murder and the family farm sold. Now it had been said at the time that this particular branch of the Technical Bureau under John Courtney were known for their heavy-handed approach in other investigations, using violence and threats to get confessions out of their subjects. Known as the murder squad, they prided themselves on getting the answers they needed. During this time period, it was also allegedly a known fact that the Gardaí would write the statements themselves and get the alleged perpetrator to sign on the dotted line. So why would their approach when interviewing the Hayes family be any different? It was also noted that these statements were gathered from the Hayes family without any legal representation present. But in a time before audio and video in the interviewing room, it is hard to know for sure what went on in those interview rooms. But it does appear that the admissions in the statements were collected after significant pressure had been put upon the family and no one was going to question them on their methods at the time. An inquiry into how these statements were obtained was ordered by the Garda Commissioner at the time, Lawrence Wren. The Hayes family were not happy that it would be the Garda themselves carrying out this inquiry and the Minister for Justice, Michael Noonan, agreed that a tribunal inquiry should be held. And so began in Tralee Court an 82-day inquiry where all the important players in the case were questioned. Unbelievably, Superintendent Courtney stated he still believed Joanne had given birth to twins and still believed Joanne was baby John's mother before saying he could never be 100% sure. All the detectives involved denied any heavy-handedness with the Hayes family. 
An abundance of witnesses were questioned, 109 to be precise. Joanne's life was again dragged through the mud and her private life in the public domain for all the vultures to devour. Judge Kevin Lynch presided over the tribunal. He was a man of his time, staunch and patriarchal. Dr John Harbison, the state pathologist, gave evidence and contradicted the Gardaí's assumption that Joanne's own baby had died after being struck with a bat brush. He said the baby had been stillborn. When it came to Joanne's turn to go on the stand, she would spend five days there. To say she was interrogated would be an understatement. Uh, I didn't expect I didn't expect a clap in the back, but I didn't expect it to go so hard on me. Um, uh, after all, the tribunal was set up to look into the behaviour of the Gardaí, but uh, it was I who went on trial. Everything from her lifestyle to her morals were under the microscope. She described the tribunal as a terrible experience on the Late Late Show saying she was under the impression it had been set up to look into the behaviour of the Gardaí. But she felt after her interrogation that it was actually her that was on trial. As the days went on, it was becoming more evident that Joanne was at breaking point. Joanne was asked by senior counsel for the Gardaí everything from questions about her menstrual cycle to her dating history, with the assumption being from the questioning approach that they believed Joanne had multiple boyfriends and very low morals. Or at least this was the impression of Joanne they were trying to get across to the public. But the public were horrified by the treatment of Joanne and began to come out in support of her and the Hayes family, with many protests being held around the country and in front of the courthouse in Tralee, with people holding banners saying, Women on trial. We support Joanne Hayes and we are angry. To name but a few. The general public's feeling was that Joanne was the one being vilified at this tribunal, when it was meant to be the Gardaí that were the focus of it. The tide appeared to be turning for the Irish people on how they perceived the treatment of women in general in our society. And for the first time they were standing up to a patriarchal society and saying, we're not happy, we're angry. Flowers even began arriving from people around the country at the courthouse for Joanne. And she could feel the support that was there for her. And this helped her through those final days of the tribunal, which would come to an end on the 14th of June, 1985. The wait was now on for the report to be published. This tribunal, after all, was meant to find out how the false confessions had been acquired from the Hayes family. On the 4th of October, 1985, the wait was over. The tribunal report was published. And to add insult to injury for Joanne and her family, Judge Kevin Lynch failed to come to any conclusion as to how these confessions had been extracted. In his report, he refers several times to when Joanne allegedly made false accusations. On reading the report, Joanne is the one that comes out looking bad and the Gardaí get off very lightly. At one stage in the report, members of the Hayes family were actually referred to as giving barefaced lies when giving their testimony. The only saving grace in the whole tribunal report for Joanne was where it concluded from the blood grouping that Joanne was not the mother of baby John. But it did conclude that Joanne had actually killed her own baby by putting her hands around the baby's neck when it started crying and choked him before hitting him with the bat brush to make sure he was dead despite despite the fact that Dr. John Harbison had said that he had concluded from the autopsy that the baby was stillborn. This conclusion goes against all the facts presented. The report was a joke and very obvious that the judge had sided with the Gardaí, not derailing from his notion that Joanne was to blame for everything. She was, after all, a woman of low morals and loose lifestyle. It's just unbelievable, really, and this is not that long ago in our history. To this day, how the false statements were acquired remains a mystery. It had been a horrendous time for the Hayeses, and especially Joanne. A shocking time in our history. Joanne describing the whole tribunal as anti-women, saying she was the underdog going into the case. She said there was no way that she would have won against such a patriarchal system. And despite the fact that the report did state that Joanne was not the mother of baby John, 
No apology was forthcoming and members of the original investigating team still believed she was the mother. After the tribunal had ended, Joanne and her family tried to return to somewhat of a normal life. Over the years, Joanne has remained out of the public eye and has refused to do any further interviews on the matter. And who could blame her? What she had been put through is just unspeakable and is in today's world hard to fathom. But the family never forgot the support they got from the general public or the people of Kerry and especially the locals around Abbey Dorney. But despite this, the question still remained. Who was baby John? And who had brutally murdered this innocent newborn little boy? For years after, the case went cold and was spoken about very little. Then, in January of 2018, some 34 years after the tribunal had ended, a door-to-door canvas by Gardaí started on Valencia Island as the serious crime review team once again tried to get answers which they believe still lie in South Kerry. This is an investigation that will be conducted from the very, very start. We are starting back at the start. The case had been reopened and with fresh eyes Gardaí were revisiting it. After all, people still wanted answers as to what had happened to baby John. When baby John was originally found on the beach at White Strand, DNA had been taken during the autopsy, but the means to test it would not become available for many years. In January of 2018, the serious crime review team requested a DNA sample from Joanne Hayes as they wanted to compare it to the sample they had taken from baby John in 1984. Joanne, initially being sceptical of the Gardaí and who would blame her, was unsure about giving the sample. But after discussing it with her solicitor, who assured her that he would make sure a female Garda took the sample, she agreed. Now, finally, after all these years, it was proved without a doubt that Joanne Hayes was categorically not the mother of baby John. A written apology from the Garda commissioner was forwarded to Joanne and a public apology was read out on national television by Superintendent Fleur Murphy, who apologised on behalf of Angarda Siakana. The Acting Garda Commissioner has written to Ms Hayes to formally apologise to her on behalf of Angarda Siakana, and I will now restate that apology. It is a matter of significant regret for Angarda Siakana that it has taken such a long time for it to be confirmed that Ms Hayes is not the mother of baby John. The tribunal headed by Mr Justice Kevin Lynch into that investigation rightly criticised many aspects of that investigation. For those failings, I apologise. It is accepted that the original investigation fell short of, of what was required and expected at a professional police service. Joanne wrote a letter in response to the apology, which her solicitor Pat Mann read out on her behalf. She thanked the people of Ireland and the people of Abbey Dorney for their support. She thanked those who sent letters to her and prayed for her throughout the years. She reiterated her hope that after all the years of suffering and stress, that the whole ordeal would finally be behind them. Her only request, she said, was for privacy and that she could return to her life within the local community in peace. Then, in 2019, Joanne and her family were awarded 2.5 million euros in damages. If not for the cold case review, Joanne would never have ultimately been vindicated and received any damages and a cloud of suspicion would have been hanging over her forevermore. Meanwhile, the investigation into who had actually murdered baby John continued in South Kerry, where Gardaí believed the answers lay. And now the Gardaí had a DNA profile of the baby. Locals were asked to give voluntary samples and the DNA database was also utilised. Questionnaires were handed out to the locals and some 400 households were questioned, but still no concrete answers were forthcoming. All went quiet in the case until 2021, when baby John's remains were exhumed to acquire more DNA samples. This is a review that, has, that we are undertaking, and we're going to utilise DNA in relation to it and to bring, it forward, bring the case forward. These DNA samples were then compared to the samples that had been taken from locals, 
to see if John had any relatives in the local area. If a relative was found, it would greatly help the investigation and the team could work back through the family tree to hopefully eventually find one of baby John's parents. Unfortunately, this yielded no results. The case came to a standstill again until the 23rd of March 2023, some five years after the case had been reopened when a man in his 60s and a woman in her 50s were arrested in relation to the case. Gardaí were able to match a voluntary DNA sample that had been taken from a person who was believed to be a sibling of baby John's and from this were able to track down who they believed to be his parents. They were held by Gardaí on suspicion of the murder of baby John. It was noted at the time in the media that they were allegedly not being very cooperative with the Gardaí. This was very frustrating for the Gardaí as they could only be held for 24 hours and after that they had to be either charged or let go. It was believed from news sources that the couple had started a relationship in the 1980s and were still together to the present day. They were both arrested from the same address. Now the Gardaí needed to get a DNA sample from the couple they believed to be baby John's parents, which they duly submitted. Everyone waited with bated breath for the results, and when they came in, it was as expected. These were baby John's parents. But being the biological parents of baby John did not necessarily mean that they had murdered him, as their solicitor was at pains to point out. During their questioning, the couple made no admission of guilt. It was also believed that the woman who was the mother of baby John is allegedly the daughter of a Garda, but he had died several years before the investigation had been relaunched into the murder of baby John. To date, their actual identities have been kept under close guard as they're not charged with any crimes. They were actually both released without charge after being questioned and a file was prepared for the DPP. The treatment they received compared to the treatment Joanne and her family had received back in 1984 are worlds apart. And rightly so. After all, everyone is innocent until they are proven guilty in a court of law. The case of the Kerry baby was ultimately to start a chain of events to bring Ireland out of the Dark Ages where religion and patriarchy ruled supreme. It got people talking. The treatment that Joanne had to endure during the tribunal at the hands of men in grey suits who simply looked down on her and formed an opinion of her based on how society at the time thought of and treated women. Slowly but surely over the years that followed, opinions began to change, the shackles were coming off, and Ireland was slowly but surely making its way into the 21st century. Into a world where women were beginning to have their voices heard and be treated as equals in society. Now through various referendums, women have more autonomy over their bodies and over their rights. And all this started from a seed that was planted when Joanne Hayes took the stand in Tralee in 1985. No longer do the state or the church rule supreme. We have come a long way. But like everywhere else in the world, we have a long way to go. And as for baby John, we can only hope that one day his story will be complete and justice will be served for a life that never even had a chance to really begin, but all the same had an impact on our society that has transcended generations. But for now, his case remains unsolved. So guys, that's it for today's episode of the Ireland Crimes and Mysteries podcast. Again, thanks for your listenership and don't forget to subscribe to the show and hit that auto download so you never miss an episode. Until the next time, keep your eyes open and your mind curious. This podcast has been compiled from information gathered in the public sphere, like news articles, documentaries and open source material that can be found on the web. Everything in this podcast is alleged unless a conviction has taken place. You've been listening to Island Crimes and Mysteries. Join Newells for another episode coming real soon. And keep up to date by following our social media sites, our YouTube channel, and our website, islandcrimesandmysteries.ie.